Hi, my name is Mark Schwartz. I'm an enterprise strategist with AWS. And I'm going to talk today a little bit about bureaucracy and how to overcome it when it's in your way. As an enterprise strategist at AWS, I work with leading companies around the world on impediments to digital transformation. Um, often things like cultural change, organizational structure, governance models, investment strategies, upskilling, things like that. And um, when, I, when I hear them tell me about the things that are challenging for them, I often realize that what's at stake is bureaucracy getting in their way. Uh, sometimes they don't call it bureaucracy. Sometimes they're talking about, say, silos, organizational silos, or maybe compliance requirements or long drawn out governance processes. Um, but for somebody who's, who um, is uh, um, experienced with bureaucracy, it all adds up for me to um, probably there's some sort of a bureaucratic mechanism that's in place that's getting in the way. I actually wrote a book about this, a book on how to overcome bureaucracy in order to succeed at digital transformation. And sometimes people ask me, why, like, why would anybody write a book on a subject like that? And the answer is um, really uh, because I was surprised nobody else had written the book. Because it is such a common difficulty for organizations trying to make major changes. And... Um, there's a lot you can do about it, actually. People tend to feel overwhelmed and powerless in the face of a bureaucracy. But uh, I found that actually there are things that you can do and that let you open up a path to transformation. So that's why I wrote the book. Uh, I consider myself a little bit of an expert on bureaucracy and how to deal with it. Because I was, before I joined AWS, the CIO of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services in the Department of Homeland Security. And as you might guess, governments tend to have a lot of bureaucracy. Um, they tend to lock in processes that they found to be the right ones in the past, and they tend to have very formalized organizational structures. And when you think about it, the, the bureaucracy that's in place is generally there to make sure things keep happening the same way as they did before. Transformation, of course, is big change. And so there's a very natural conflict between these two things. And it makes sense that you're going to run into obstacles. So when I, when I joined AW, oh, when I joined, sorry, USCIS, I discovered that our IT organization how to release cycle time, meaning the time between releases of our IT systems, that was on average 18 months or so. Um, to me, that's, that's a really long release cycle. We also had a few famously failing government IT projects, you know, the kinds of things that you read about in the newspapers, uh, even one where we had spent about a billion dollars or so and didn't really have anything to show for it. It amazed me when I first joined that you could actually spend a billion dollars on what was essentially a software development project. But uh, it happens in the government. And it might be connected to the fact that we had an oversight process in the government, or in DHS specifically, that involved for each system writing something like 87 documents and going through 11 stage gate reviews in order to get approval uh, to move on to the next stage in each case. So uh, perhaps there was a connection between, <laughs> between that and the long cycle times uh, and the big projects that uh, took a long time to complete. By the time I left, we had changed that to the point where we were releasing code for most of our major systems on the average about three times a day. So uh, that maybe is a way to measure the extent of the transformation going from 18 months between releases to three releases a day or so. To get there, we had to change a lot. And uh, the way that we did it essentially was by banging into bureaucratic impediments. And as we hit each one, we would think, how can we get around this one? Or how can we deal with this one? We would find a way and then we'd hit the next impediment and the next. So that's why I'd like to talk about how you can deal with these things. 
and how you can succeed at a, at a big digital transformation, even when you're encountering those kinds of impediments. So before I go any further, I should probably give, give you uh, an idea of what I mean by bureaucracy. And I'm going to use more or less the standard definition from academia. It's, it's generally credited to Max Weber, the sociologist who was writing in the early 1920s. Um, he, he didn't give a, a compact uh, little definition that we can use, but you can sort of abstract from what he was saying that bureaucracy technically is a kind of social organization, first of all, that's based on universally applied rules and carefully delineated roles or authorities. Um, and those rules, uh, those, those roles are filled by people chosen by a merit system. So these are, let's say, the three main characteristics that I pull out of his definition is it's got roles, uh, rules, sorry, that are applied uh, in a rigid way. It's got roles that are carefully delineated in a, a separation of duties, you know, a delineation of responsibilities. And it's staffed by people according to merit. Or uh, I simplify it even further sometimes by saying a bureaucracy consists of rigid rules and rigid roles. So a few quick observations just based on that definition. Uh, the first is that bureaucracy is around us all the time. We just don't necessarily notice it because it's not in our way. So for example, think about the ancient Greek gods on Mount Olympus. They, um, okay, they weren't very big on following rules, but in terms of roles, they definitely had uh, a separation of responsibilities, let's say a delineation of responsibilities. You had one god who was in charge of winds. You had another god who was in charge of the sea. You had a god who was in charge of drunkenness. What a great job. Um, and, uh, and their responsibilities were carefully separated from one another. If you think about, um, sometimes if you watch children playing games, you'll notice that they spend even more time arguing about the rules of the game than actually playing it. Again, this is, this is bureaucratic behavior. Um, they learn it probably from their parents because think about, um, okay kids, your bedtime is 8 p.m. and you have to go to bed at 8 p.m., no exceptions. Well, this is fixed rigid rules, as I said, and also fixed roles. You know, I'm, I'm the daddy, I'm the mommy. Uh, I'm the one who makes who gets to choose these rules, right? These are these are all bureaucratic structures, even though we might not think of them as bureaucracy. Um, it's when these things get in our way that we start to call them bureaucracy, and we start to feel badly about them uh, and and get annoyed and frustrated. So, when you think about a, a business organization. Business organizations really, to a large extent, are based on the idea of bureaucracy. You have a, an org chart, and in the org chart, you separate the responsibilities, let's say, of sales, marketing, uh, product development, whatever, and you define formal patterns of interaction between them. For example, maybe marketing produces leads, and those go to sales, and sales does X and Y to follow up. This is essentially more or less a, a bureaucratic structure. Um, sometimes we call it siloing, really. And uh, bureaucracy is, it's not just a corporate thing, it's something that is, it's sometimes called the, the essence of modernity in modern society. Um, it became very popular during the age when monarchies were overthrown, essentially, and mass democracy was instituted, monarchs can be very arbitrary, uh, and nepotism, of course, is a big thing in a monarchy. That was all replaced with the advent of, of modern democracies by the idea of rule by law, of government positions that are well-defined and people were chosen, hopefully by merit, to fill those government positions and so on. What I'm, what I'm really trying to get at is bureaucracy isn't an evil, horrible thing, you know, that should cause some kind of existential angst, which it often does. 
it's it's a, a way of structuring an org organization and a, a way of controlling the patterns of interaction between people in an organization. In fact, in many cases, bureaucracy is, is good and quite necessary. To give you a few examples, uh, let's take compliance. We, uh, most large enterprises have to comply with some sort of requirements, Sarbanes-Oxley or HIPAA, uh, FISMA, whatever it is. In order to comply with those things, you almost have to have a bureaucratic structure. You have to show that you've got formal controls and that the controls are being applied and that people are accountable for making sure that the controls were applied and can sign off on them. Um, that's very close to the definition of bureaucracy right there. And it would be very hard to demonstrate compliance if you couldn't show all of those things. Another example that I like to point to because it's so counterintuitive is marketing, branding, um, as an example. So for a brand to have value, it has to be very consistently expressed. So maybe the company's logo has to be used in a certain way. Certain fonts have to be used. I'm told that McDonald's has a huge operating manual that tells each franchise exactly what it has to do to be a McDonald's franchise. This is, this is bureaucracy. And it's bureaucracy to good purpose uh, because brands have a lot of value and they have more value when they're expressed in a very consistent way. I'll give you one more example that I learned along the way. At USCIS, my employees were unionized. This was the IT employees. And we had a big collective bargaining agreement that expressed the agreement between the union and management. And while normally you would think of bureaucracy as something that management imposes on employees, in fact, a collective bargaining agreement is um, it's really bureaucracy that the employees are imposing on management. So it had rules for management to follow, like how big a cubicle should be depending on the employee's rank in the, in the agency, um, or uh, what the process for promoting people would be, and how seniority had to be factored into it, and things like that. So bureaucracy is sometimes there for a good purpose, and as I said, we don't tend to notice it when it's being used for those purposes. We notice it when it's in our way, as it often is with digital transformation. So what I noticed, you know, that, that led to the train of thought of how, what's the difference between good bureaucracy and bad bureaucracy? And uh, I noticed that there are three characteristics that I could pin down that bureaucracies often take on, but it, it's not necessarily part of bureaucracy, but bureaucracies often get these three attributes, and they are the three attributes that re we really hate. So, for example, the first one is that bureaucracies tend to become bloated. It's sort of a cliche, bloated bureaucracies, but not every bureaucracy has to be bloated, in fact. I associate bloat with the idea of, of lean manufacturing, lean theory, the other, the other lean techniques. Bloat means there's waste in the process, and if you can extract that waste, then you still get the same results, but you get those results with much less effort, much less wasted effort. Um, so bloat is one of the things that drives us crazy. You know, you have to fill out all these different forms with all this information that might not be relevant. Um, maybe an example is the 87 documents I told you about before. Uh, that's, that's a pretty good example of bloat. The second characteristic I noticed is that bureaucracies often petrify. And what I mean by petrify is that the rules of the bureaucracy stop changing. They get locked into place and they continue on even as circumstances on the outside change. There's no reason why a bureaucracy has to petrify either. As I, um, as I said before, the, the rules have to be universally applied. That's true. When you have a rule, everybody has to follow it. But that doesn't say that the rules can't change. And then when the rule changes, everybody has to follow the new rule. The third characteristic of a bureaucracy that's getting in the way is that it's coercive. Bureaucracies tend to try to control people's behavior. They tend to say no a lot. 
Um, and they tend to uh, restrict or constrain what you can do. So I realized that with these three characteristics, there was an opposite of each characteristic. And if you could take your bureaucracy and transform it from having these three characteristics to having the opposite characteristics, it would be a lot easier to transform the organization even with the bureaucracy in place. So the three opposite characteristics are leanness instead of bloat, uh, learning, learningness, learning instead of petrification, and enablement instead of coercion. So perhaps we could take our bureaucracy that's bloated and use good lean practices to find ways to eliminate some of the bloat and some of the waste. Perhaps we could take a bureaucracy that had petrified rules and we could set it up so that it would actually learn and adjust its rules over time based on feedback and, and monitoring of the results. And instead of a bureaucracy that's coercive, that's basically oriented to telling people not to do things, we could make a bureaucracy that's enabling, where the bureaucracy is actually assisting people in doing their jobs. And all three of these things uh, are very much possible. In fact, there are great examples out there of bureaucracies that are, in fact, lean and learning and enabling. And in my book, I walk through some examples of what they look like. When I thought about what worked for us at USCIS in order to effect this transition from those bad characteristics to the good characteristics, I realized that there were a number of techniques that we used, and some of them were successful sometimes and unsuccessful other times. But on the whole, I had sort of a catalog of something like 30 or so techniques that we used in order to change the spirit of the bureaucracy from, from the bad kind to the good kind. And I realized that those techniques sort of group themselves into three personalities or personas, I call them. Those are the personas of the monkey, the razor, and the sumo wrestler. It might not be obvious how those are connected to transforming bureaucracies, but I'll, I'll drill down a little bit and give you a, a bit of an idea how I think about them. But one reason why I like to divide them into, into these three personas is that I, I came up with about 30 tricks that I've tried that have worked pretty well, but you can think of your own. The best way to start brainstorming uh, based on your own situation is to think in terms of these three personas. What would the monkey do? What would the razor do? What would the sumo wrestler do? So let's, let's look at the monkey first. Everybody knows that monkeys are mischievous, right? In cultures around the world, there are legends of monkeys that are mischievous. Uh, it's, a, it's a very common theme. And yeah, we were a little mischievous in our approach to bureaucracy. I've listed some of the techniques that I associate with the monkey. The, the key technique, the one that really sums up the monkey, is the one I call provoke and observe. This is kind of parallel to the agile idea of inspecting and adapting. So in order to understand the bureaucracy that you're facing better, one thing you can do is try something a little provocative and watch what happens. And when you watch what happens, that teaches you what goes on in the bureaucracy, what it will tolerate, what it won't tolerate. Uh, I'll give you an example from my experience. I keep telling you about these 87 documents. So I'll tell you a little bit more. The documents were based on templates that we were given. And in order to write these documents, we had to fill in each section of the template. And this often led to really long documents, wasteful. Um, and those documents didn't necessarily convey a lot of information. There was just a lot of wording there because you had to fill in every section of the template. So as a monkey type provoke and observe mood move, what we did was we first of all started writing shorter answers in each section of the template. We just tried it to see what would happen. And then we started trying leaving out sections of the template if we thought they didn't make any sense for what we were doing. So we were still following the spirit of, of the rule. We were still providing useful information in the document, but we were only providing useful information in the document. And we didn't know what was gonna happen when we did this. Nobody tried it before. Well, it turned out in this case, the bureaucracy loved it. 
the people who had to read these documents, they said, we never intended for people to go and write these long documents. We don't have time to read them. Um, so through provoking, we had actually moved one of the big bureaucratic impediments out of the way. It could have turned out that they were not happy. <laughs> and if they were not happy, well, that would tell us something about who exactly wasn't happy and what they said and what parameters they would establish, what they would let us do. So that's the monkey in a nutshell. The razor, the razor cuts away bloat. That's really the job of the razor. Um, the razor is all about simplification. Sometimes you can uh, think of bureaucracy as a factory. It's a factory that produces compliance, right? That's the product that pops out at the end of bureaucracy. And like any factory, you could look at it as a value stream where there was a series of steps. And when you put all those steps together, you get your product. And in lean manufacturing, you could look at that value stream and ask yourself, where is there waste in this value stream? We still want to produce the product, which is compliance. We still want to satisfy the original reason why compliance was needed. But we don't want to do it in, with more effort than is necessary to actually <coughs> excuse me, accomplish those goals. So in a way, that's what we were doing with those 87 documents. <clears throat> we were streamlining them while trying to keep the same intent alive, right? Accomplish the same things. So that's an example of how you use the razor to turn your bureaucracy from a bloated one into a lean one. The sumo wrestler maybe requires a, a bit of explanation. I lived in Japan for a year, and uh, like a lot of Westerners who live in Japan, I, I fell in love with sumo wrestling. The idea, um, you know, you have two, two big wrestlers, and they, they butt up against each other, right? And so you have two very powerful forces, and I consider bureaucracy one of those powerful forces. And there's a subtlety here. Um, since the object of the game is to push your opponent out of the ring or get your opponent to leave the ring or get them to touch the ground with something other than their feet, your uh, first thought is you should push really hard to try to push your opponent out of the ring. But if you try that and your opponent is smart, they might just pull you. And if they pull you when you're pushing, you're going to go flying out of the ring and you're going to lose the match. So in sumo, you have this balance of forces pushing against each other. And what you really want to do is use your opponent's strength against him. And that's how you win the match. So let's bring this to bureaucracy for a moment. In a bureaucracy, the bureaucracy has tremendous force. And one of the most powerful ways to uh, get beyond the bureaucracy is to use the bureaucracy's force against it itself or take advantage of that force. So while we had this complicated set of rules around how we had to do everything and all the documents and all of that, um, we tried fighting it by creating our own bureaucracy. And my bureaucracy, in fact, said that instead of 87 documents, we had 15 required documents. And instead of 11 gate reviews, we had two. And they could be done in 15 minutes each online. And uh, we required that. And we required DevOps and uh, uh, agile ways of working. And we wrote them into a very formal statement of policy. And we rolled it out. And uh, the reaction was quite interesting. One, one uh, beautiful thing about bureaucracy, really, is you have a lot of auditors who are enforcing policy. And so I set it up so that whenever they audited one of our projects, they would be checking to make sure that it was using DevOps and that it was moving along nimbly and writing short documents and all of those things. So that's an example of the sumo wrestler using the bureaucracy's force against itself, essentially. So those are the, the three personas. And we use those personas, uh, as you can see from these slides, there were a lot of other aspects of each of those three personas that we took advantage of. But when we put it all together, we found that almost every impediment that we faced, uh, I wouldn't say they went away exactly, but we could find a way to work with them and even make the bureaucracy even better and make it support our digital transformation. Um, so that's why I wrote 
a book about bureaucracy. Um, and that's uh, what I hope will help our customers who are facing bureaucratic impediments find a way to deal with it. Because as I said, when we're faced with bureaucracy, often our reaction is, Oh, this is, you know, this is like a Kafka novel or something, you know, uh, it's very disturbing. But it doesn't need to be. Bureaucracy is really just a way of organizing. And it's the, um, it, it's uh, what you do with that organization that really matters when you're trying to do a transformation. So if you want to learn a little bit more, uh, you can read my book, The Delicate Art of Bureaucracy, Digital Transformation with the Monkey, the Razor, and the Sumo Wrestler. Uh, there's also a, a handy little one-page summary of all of the plays, as I call them, uh, from the Monkey, the Razor, and the Sumo Wrestler, and at a high level, what they are. Um, bureaucracy really is just one of those impediments to digital transformation. And our little group at AWS Enterprise Strategy and other organizations within AWS just love to help our customers succeed in their digital transformations. We like to work as partners aligned with the success of our customers. Uh, bureaucracy is one of the things we can help with. As I said, there are all sorts of other things around cultural change and organizational structure and governance and so on. So uh, please, please do let us know what sorts of challenges you're having, and we'll try to find the right resources to help you on them. So you joined the summit, presumably because you wanted to learn some things. And learning doesn't need to stop with the summit itself. We have a training and certification program at AWS that, that can be very powerful for enterprises looking to transform. Um, 451 Research did a study where they, they saw that 90% of IT decision makers said there's a gap between their team's skill levels and what they actually need in order to reach their business goals in the cloud. So we, have, we try very hard to be able to help fill that gap for our customers. Um, we offer virtual classroom training, uh, private training, um, free digital courses that can help. We have certification to validate people's expertise and, uh, and motivate employees to develop those cloud skills. We have materials that can be used for, uh, to see best practices, to see what good architectures are. Um, we also have programs like AWS Restart and AWS Academy to try to uh, provide people the skills that they need in order to work in the cloud and in the digital world. So for more information, please take a look at our website, AWS training slash enterprise, and see what other resources are available. With that, thank you very much for listening. And please remember to complete the session survey. Uh, your feedback is very important to us. So thanks again.